Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to tonight's episode of the Freedom Series with George McCoskey, where we're going to deep dive into understanding more around property, wealth creation strategies, and creating a life of more fun, more freedom, and more fulfillment. George, how are you doing tonight? Hey, really good, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me here on your podcast. I'm very excited. Right, grateful to have you here. And uh, for any of you guys that are joining us live, my team uh, are across the platforms in the comments section. So please, uh, throughout tonight's conversation, put in any questions or comments you've got. Uh, they'll feed them back to us. We can get them answered for you as well. Show us a bit of love and support. Hit the love and the like button. Let us know you're watching and uh, we'll do our best to get you guys some amazing answers to your questions tonight. So George, how long ago did you buy your first property? Let, let's start there. Okay. I bought my first property actually when I was 27. Wow. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I started late. Late bloomer. Um, yeah, late bloomer. Look, I, I knew that I wanted property, to buy property from a young age. So what happened was when I was about 16, I entered a lottery to win a Commodore. One of those Commodores worth 60 grand back in those days. Right. I thought if I get this Commodore, I'm selling it and buying two houses because houses in those days were 30 grand, right? So I was always thinking property, but I got waylaid along the way, mm. traveled around, had a lot of fun. But finally, uh, I bought my first property and that was actually in Adelaide. Uh, yep. In an old, old suburb, when I first bought it, I was actually in the middle of running an event. So I, I bought it at an auction and I'm running an event. I've locked the door. I'm bidding. People are knocking the door and I'm like, oh shit, what's happening here? It was um, pretty crazy. And the funny thing is after I bought it, I wasn't sure if I was happy or sad. See? Okay. Tell me more. Because yeah. I, I, won, I won it. Did I pay too much? Is it the right property? What am I doing? You know what I mean? It's one ah, of the most I second guess you know? yourself. So, you know, I had a bit of buyer's remorse. I was a bit happy. I didn't know what to do. I was sort of confused. But when I woke up the next day, I thought, you know what? I bought a property. That's it. I'm in. Okay. 27 years old. So a fairly late-ish bloomer to the party. And you then went on to like, how many years did it take you to, to move to a position where you're financially free through the, the income you're making from those properties? Well, what happened was when I first started investing in property investments, I was... Back in those days, negative gearing was popular. Yeah. You know, still popular today, but not with me and our, yeah. our group. And what happened was I was negative gearing, so I'd buy one house, there's minus 300, buy another house, there's minus 250. Before you know it, seven days a week, I'm just working my ass off. Yeah. You know? And, you know, property, I knew property was the answer, but it didn't look like it at the time. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, I'm actually working harder, not less, because property was supposed to give me more freedom. And uh, I tried flipping, I tried renovating, I tried lots of different things. Mm. See, there's a difference, I'm gonna go back to this in a second, between making money through labor and making money through capital, which mm. is a very important distinction. But what I did is I thought, you know, this is not really helping, I'm not actually doing any better, I'm working longer hours. So it's, I had two doors. One door was give up property, and the other door was really work it out. And luckily I chose door number two. Right. And I call that my million dollar decision because the first decision I made was really work this out and find out about property. Yeah. Because quitting was an option because yeah. I came from a family that struggled to make ends meet. I wasn't born with a silver spoon. I wasn't going to inherit a fortune. Yeah. And I know had no other option. That's part of the reason I had to do property because I, you know, I knew 90% of people that became millionaires in the world did it through mm -hmm. property. So I wanted to have this odd stack to my favor. And second thing I did is I ignored everyone else out there giving real estate advice because they were super spammy. They didn't have the run, run, runs on the board and they just, they were trying to sell stuff instead of actually teach, teach you how to do it. Yeah. The third, third thing I do is found mentors that had real life results. People who were actually living the lifestyle I wanted to live because there's no point in someone saying, hey, be like me and they're working 100 hours a week. I wanted yes. to see people that were actually living off property and relaxing and having fun. Yeah, yeah. There's a really important distinction you mentioned before too that I see relates not just with property but the business and life in general. And that was the decision, the million dollar decision you made that you're going to work it out at any cost. You know, whether that meant losing money, whether that, whether that meant spending money, whether that meant, you know, investing money in, in mentors or whatever else. You made a decision that, you know what, like I'm, I'm all in on this yep. and I'm going to work it out. 27 years old, maybe, but I don't know, back then people weren't necessarily thinking about building a property empire. Um, you know, no, many they people. Weren't, they weren't, no. no, people used to buy one and that didn't stop because there's your 300 bucks gone a week, which in those days was half your salary, you know what I mean? So yeah. 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 
And so tell me, how did that eventuate then to go from like, I'm going to, I'm going to work it out uh, to where you're at now, which, which, you know, to kind of fast forward, you got to a position and to kind of spoiler alert, you got to a position where your, your property created passive income. You were financially free, didn't have to get out of bed, didn't have to work. Um, it's got a beautiful property for yourself and so forth and live, live an amazing lifestyle. But then obviously to the, perspe- perspe- to the position of like, oh, now I want to give back and I want to help other people fast track the journey that I had. Like, where did that start for you? Because like, you're now a mentor to many. Uh, I know that a lot of our clients have used your services. I've, I've certainly been involved for a while now as well. Um, and the experience has been phenomenal in terms of the property we purchased, the positive gearing, the, the capital growth and so forth. But where was the first kind of step up for you or the hand up for you in that process? You know, like you, you made the decision, you talked about getting mentors. What was, what happened after that? Okay. Um, after I retired or before I retired? Before. Let's start at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Before I retired. So what I did is I, I went around looking for people that were successful in property and decided to model what they did. And mm-hmm. I found some people really good at paying off their mortgage quicker. Other people really good at finding um, depreciation and getting the things done. So I didn't invent anything that I do. All I did is I thought, okay, this guy's doing this great stuff. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that. And I created the model. And just using, because even one of these things alone was working really well. Yeah. But putting them together was just supercharged. Yeah. And using that within a few short years, I retired. Because yeah. what I did was restructured my loans. I mean, a lot of times what happens is a lot of people got their loans wrong. You know, we recently had a, a member join our program about two months ago. And the first month, we've changed them and saved them $58,000 a year. Yeah just in expenses. Now, that's almost like getting a second job and a high yeah. paying one of that. Yeah. So, so once I used a few of these strategies, I changed things around and it really boosted everything. And yeah. because I'd been doing property for a while, I didn't start from scratch. So I did it a few short years, but I had those the seven years beforehand of having property as well, working hard. So yeah. I was an overnight success after 10 years of hard work. Yeah, which is, which is typical. It's just not often what people show on their highlight reels through social. And and it's interesting because I remember we had a distinct conversation as well. Like I can speak from my own experience, but we had a conversation with one small tweak that you shared with me around structuring loans that was a huge, it was a game changer. And I was like, holy shit, why has no one ever shared that with me before? It's something so simple, but it makes logical sense. But it's not just not the way that we're trained to, to think as well. Um, I had some questions coming in here as well. Guys, if you're watching, welcome to uh, this evening's Freedom Series podcast. We're speaking all things investments, uh, property with uh, George, Mc- George McCoskey. Uh, William from Sydney, what are the main mistakes that new hot to trot investors often make when dealing with property? Good question. Well, great question. Really, great question. See, this is the one thing I've got to say about investing. Property investing is not the best investment. There you go. I've said it. I'm waiting for it. Okay, the number one investment you can make is in yourself. Mm. And it always will be you. Because you need to really educate yourself. And the big problem is people, instead of investing in themselves first, invest in property first, which is wrong. Because the biggest return you're ever going to get is investing in yourself. And I really believe you've got to invest in yourself, invest in education. And that's the first step of getting there. Because without that, you're really floundering around and not being an expert and you shouldn't do that you know what i mean and, and and that's an investment you've got for the rest of your life and this is what i often um say to people and what i share in my book as well it's like you know if you can build one business that can be profitable uh have some form of purpose behind it and work without you once you go through that initiation let's call it initiation right yep. Yep. uh get punched in the face a few times and get knocked down and get back up you can do it again and again and again and again across multiple businesses because you've gone through and you've mastered the steps and more importantly, the psychological switches that you have to make to be there. It's the same with you. It's like if you were to go bankrupt today, for argument's sake, you can get back to where you are a lot quicker than having having never got there in the first place. Absolutely, of course, because you've got the ability. Well, they, they, um, they reckon if, if they've distributed the money around the world, that it wouldn't take long before it ended up in the hands of the few again you know what i mean if we redistribute wealth because you know because there's the there's the rich mentality and the poor mentality and you know the poor mentality is you know you get money you spend it on stuff 
and yeah. live, 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 live paycheck to paycheck. Right. Week and week. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then you've got the mentality of the rich where when you get money, you invest it. You invest mm -hmm. it in yourself, you invest it in education, in mentors, in your health, in fitness, in your life. Which, which requires you to put aside those short-term grat gratification, right? It's like the, it's like the marshmallow test. Uh, that's exactly like the marshmallow test. I'm so, I'm so glad you brought that up. Do you want to um, talk about the marshmallow test? What's that? Do you want to explain it to people that don't know what it is? Uh, there was a, who, who was it? Was it Harvard? It was Harvard University. Yeah, Harvard U University did a study where they basically got a bunch of kids in. Uh, they sat them down in a room uh, with nothing but a table and a marshmallow in front of them. And they said that they could leave the marshmallow there um, for a certain period of time. They'd give them two marshmallows. And they went back and left the room, left the kid there and, and basically filmed what happened. And what they noticed is time and time again is that the kids got to a certain point where their, their, will, uh, you know, their, their will cracked, their desire rose and they started to like smell or touch or nibble the marshmallow. And then it was like game over. Like next yep. minute the thing's gone. And there was very few that actually, that actually had the willpower it was like well, the, 3%. Yeah, 3% had the willpower to leave it to, to, to basically get the greater reward. And this is exactly a demonstration of what happens when we're talking about wealth generation is so often, you know, if we, if we relate it back to business, it's like we start making a profit early on. So we rip that profit back out to go and buy a fancy car or a big TV or maybe even a property without, rather than reinvesting that back into your business that's generating you cash mm -hmm. and seeing it as a cash generating machine, the same as the same as property. A question here from Greg from Sydney. Uh, if you guys are joining us live tonight, welcome. So grateful that you're here. Uh, please do us a favor, hit like, let us know that you're watching and also post your comments below and we'll get an answer for you. Uh, Greg from Sydney, what are your top three, uh, the top three bet for hottest property markets outside of Australia? I know what you're gonna say here. Okay, look, I, um, I only specialize in Australia. <laughs> yeah. right? However, I'll, I will tell you what the top markets are anyway. Because what I've done is I've looked at the whole world as a whole. And there's, there's gainers, there's sustainers, and there's losers. And there's a lot of losers out there. Yeah, say trainers, but... Yeah. <laughs> right? And um, the gainers, the, ga the countries that are gainers, the number one country is Australia. So you're in the right country. Well done. Wow. Awesome. And you look at um, COVID, for example, at the moment, there's a recession around the world. We've been this, we've been hit hardly at all. And look at back 2008 as well. So Australia is actually very immune to the world problems because most of our wealth is created within within Australia. You know, a lot of people think a lot of people think mining is such a big deal, but it's only about eight or nine percent of the of our GDP. Seventy percent of our GDP is small businesses in Australia servicing other people. So we're very self-sustaining, but also we've got a lot of immigration coming in. So because of that, Australia is going up in property. So other countries that are doing the same thing is New Zealand. Mm. New Zealand is very similar and they're probably my second top country. Then Israel actually is growing. What? Yep, Israel's growing. It hasn't got a lot yeah, of land. Because it's all about demand supply ratio. Yeah. And funny enough, Singapore is a great place to buy property. Mm. I mean, it's tiny. You can walk yeah. from one side to the other in the afternoon. Yeah. And um, that's the countries that are growing the most. Yeah. Offhand. There might be one or two others, but they're the main countries that are growing offhand. So I'd say out of Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Singapore. And not in that order. I think it's uh, New Zealand, Singapore, Israel. Yeah. Love that. Love that. And Matty Boy just commented here. It looks like you've got a, a fanboy. Uh, he said the 14 day challenge is awesome. I know you recently ran a 14 day challenge where you took people through and taught them aspects of your methodology and how to kind of get into the marketplace. And he's just commented here that was awesome. Uh, so maybe Rafi can put a comment or a link below uh, for the 14 day challenge for anyone who wants to check that out for you as well. So George, let's speak about your proven methodology because like what I love, what I love the most about it is it's a bunch of stuff, but what I love, it's not the most, what I love is that, you know, you've gone and done this for yourself You've stepped out, made a decision. Hey, like I've got a, I've got an ability, I've got a gift, I've got a, a knowing, I've got a, a, a product here that I can help other people to achieve what I've achieved as well. Like if I can do it, I can help them do it, and I can help them do it a lot quicker, not having gone through what I've been through. Let's talk a little bit about your methodology. Like how have you replicated the same results you've got for yourself for many, many clients now uh, all around Australia that are that are starting to profit through property? Okay, so basically, um, I started off helping family and friends you know, helping them out. And I started sort of laying it out and, because what happened was,
people didn't understand what was happening. So I had to keep mm -hmm. trying to educate people more and more. And as I did that, I, it became more of an education thing. Mm -hmm. you know? And I've helped, you know, I've got over 2000 people in our group and we're growing. So I've helped a lot of people in property yeah. and I've got a lot of experience. And after helping so many people, I know exactly what they need. Mm. And um, I've made it into very small chunks. That's why, you know, Matt, thank you very much for the shout out. But um, with um, the 14 day challenge, I decided to put in 21 modules and give people little steps. That would totally mess with my OCD, having 21 modules over 14 days. I'm just, I'm just saying. Because we've got a pre-challenge. And all right got, is that know, seven days no five days oh and that would got, totally mess with my OCD. Wait, then you got 14 days and then you got the work uh, then you got the graduation webinar where i add the two last modules okay all right but it works what, so what i did is i did it because of covid and people were stuck at home yeah and i wanted to give people something practical to do and that yeah. way you know you've got between 10 minutes to a couple of hours of homework each night and you've got this little thing to do but what happens at the end of the day by the time you finish this you've created a multi-million dollar property portfolio game plan. Yeah. Which is the first step after you invest in yourself because then you've got a plan. Yeah. And this plan will serve you for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, forever. Because a lot of people don't realize what their goals are. They don't know how many assets they've got. They don't know what they need, what they want, how to get there. No clarity. And we just go through and give them that clarity. Yeah. You know what though? Like I think the biggest turn off though is it's boring. Um, and, and this is what stops, I think, a lot of people doing it. Like it's the same with business. Yep. Like business does not have to be complex or challenging or difficult. Uh, you know, a boring business is often a very profitable business. Exactly. What you've done is very smart, and that's true. Because look, you know, any strategy that's exciting is not a passive investment. It's not an investment strategy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, a good investment strategy. Warren Buffett says this has to be boring. You know, yeah, because well, not, not, not emotional, not emotional. Yeah. Because what happens is there's no ups and downs. It's just constant because with property, it's time in the market that matters. It takes time. So there's a lot of people out there talking about get rich quick schemes and you can buy a property for a dollar and make a hundred thousand overnight and all this sort of stuff, but it's not sustainable. And the problem is there's a lot of skill involved to be able to do it anyway, if you can and luck. And what I've done is I've created a program where you don't need the skill. You don't need the luck. You just need to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Aspects of that though, too, is that, you know, it does take time yet. It's okay. If there's an aspect of certainty that that's going to mature over time and it's going to fruit. I think a bigger issue is people go into the market and educate like the first place that I bought, um, it seemed like it was a great place to buy. It seemed like a good area. Knew nothing about property. Didn't educate myself, right? Just just went into the marketplace. And that property sat there for six or seven years and and literally still worth the same amount of money as what it was when when it was bought. Now, granted, it's it's been a good savings account in terms of a way, like if I hadn't have bought it, the money wouldn't have been there. But I had no idea what I was doing versus other properties that I've purchased through you or noticed clients have purchased through you have increased in capital value in a very short period of time, like months, not years as well. And obviously we're talking property cycle clocks too. You don't know whether you're at one o'clock or 10 o'clock on the property cycle either. Exactly, exactly. And um, basically I suppose with property, property doubles every seven, 10, 12 years. You know, on the average, it averages around 7.2% per year, which is 10 years. But if you choose the right property, it's gonna go quicker. So if you yeah. buy a $500,000 property, because you know, properties would be like the weather. The weatherman can tell you the average average temperature of Adelaide in five years time, but he can't tell you the exact temperature next week. Mm. You know, because the long term is more consistent, funny enough. The law of averages, right? The law of averages. That's why, you know, I, I can't predict if a property is going to jump up 20 grand in the next month. Yeah. But I can predict if it's going to double in seven or 10 years. Yeah. So if you buy a $500,000 property in 10 years, it's going to be worth a million and you're going to make 500,000. Now the average business or person can't save that much and have a discipline to do that. So a property is going to kick your ass, right? When it comes to earning money. And that's why I think whether you're self-employed, whether you're a business person or whether you work for someone, some of the money you take, you need to invest in property. So then, because I, I really think, you know, if you haven't replaced your income through property, that should be your number one goal. Yeah. 
Yeah. If, if, and look, especially because you, you know you deal with business people, and a lot of business people they make a lot of money, but they don't, don't have no money. They don't know what to do with it. Yeah, but but equally too, like business business is not necessarily a wealth generating tool, right? It's now, a cash outside, generating tool. outside of obviously building a company and positioning yourself for acquisition or, or for sales or like that, business is a good cash generating tool. But I think that you need a diversified portfolio. You know, the money that you make in your business, sure, reinvest it back into marketing, reinvest it back into growth and resource and so forth. But there should be an aspect of that you're pulling off the table, putting into into shares, into bonds, into property and so forth, depending on obviously your strategy. I'm not a financial advisor. Yep. I'm, I'm curious to know that too, George, like your and you, your opinion um, around like shares versus property. Like I know that you're all in on property. It served you very, very well um, and still continues to serve you well. I'd love to kind of get your viewpoint around shares versus property. Okay, I'll give you my viewpoint. <laughs> now, with, with shares, right, what happens is each year they redo the index. So let's say, for example, if a company folds and disappears, it's gone the next year. They don't actually, they don't actually quantify it. Yeah. So you can imagine each year they get rid of all the shit shares, and when you look at the average shares, it's only for the ones that survived, not the ones that have died. Mm. right but with property properties don't get wiped out very often mm. so you've got a more realistic figure so when you look at the average growth of property average growth of shares the shares one is skewed mm. it's not real mm. I don't know how skewed it is because I'm not an expert in shares yeah. um, but you know but I think um, it is skewed and like I, I caught up for lunch with the Wolf of Wall Street Jordan mm. Belfort in Melbourne recently and we were having lunch, and I, I asked him a few questions. I said, "Look, you know, you know, you know, all the stuff that you did, would you do it again?" And he said, "Yes, I would." <laughs> he goes, "Especially the drugs." Now, I'm not sure I shouldn't probably say that, but anyway. But then I said, "What about shares? Like, what is the story of shares? Like, how do you make money on shares?" He goes, "George, you've got to be a big player." He said, "You can't. The mums and dads don't make money on the shares. They do it by luck. The big boys, they control it all. They know what's going on. They're the ones that make." Same with crypto. Like yeah. Mass manipulation. Exactly. And the problem is, if you're a small player, you can't compete with those billionaires. Mm. So you should really play a game that you can compete in. And with property, because it's individual, there's no one controlling the market. Yeah. So yeah. It's, um, I, I think personally, because of that, it's safer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and also, I mean, you know the saying, safe as... Shit. Houses. <laughs> Safe as houses, safe as property. They say safe as houses. I've never heard anyone say safe as shares or safe as Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, it's volatile as Bitcoin. That's a whole nother subject. Uh, well, look, when, 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 when everyone was asking me about Bitcoin, I said, look, put 1% or half percent of your money in it. Yeah. And if you, what you afford to lose, if you lose it and you're happy about losing it, do it because it's a massive gamble. Yeah. Because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So I, I chucked in a little bit of money, a very small percentage of my wealth, just chucked it in and just for, for the hell of it. But it's not, an, it's not an investment strategy, it's more of a speculation. And yeah. I really think your main investment strategy shouldn't be speculation, it should be really planned out and proper. You know, because you know, a lot of these people, when they invest, they're, they're addicted to this really terrible drug called hopium. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm coming out of them today, aren't I? Hey, drop them bombs. You'll love that. You look, love and that. hopium, is, it's not a good plan. Hope is not yeah. a good plan. You really need the plan to be able to do it. And yeah, the yeah. thing is, like, my view of property investing is similar to your view of, of business. See, what I admire about you, and that's why I've got you as my coach, is because you know the difference between labor and capital. Because, see, labor is when you work for a dollar. Mm. Capital is when the dollar works for you and makes you money while you sleep. And see, mm. passive money makes you make money when you sleep, you make money when you're awake, you make money just whenever. Mm. We're late, you've got to work for it. And I love the way that you help people create freedom from their business mm. with getting them out of labor into capital. That's the mindset. Yeah. So we've got the same mindset, just a slightly different vehicle. And I think both are very important. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, as I said, like not financial advisors, n neither of us are. No. Um, what, what, I, what I like though, is that you've gone deep on, on one thing. Like you've gone all in on property, you found a way to make it work and you replicated that time and time again. And, and obviously you're in a very comfortable position now as well. 
Um, and you've now diversified into teaching people to do the same thing. And there's other aspects that are wealth generating tools for you. I had a conversation on a live stream this morning with Mary, who's a coach uh, around like branding, helping seven and eight figure businesses. And she was all around like personal branding, but helping people find out what their uniqueness is or what their one thing is, what's the problem that they've solved and going like super deep on that. Right. And when we spoke about like, you know, th these, these gurus or people selling you overnight success, like, and being able to make money while you sleep. And I, I kind of called her forwards and said, well, I believe you can make money while you sleep. Just not the time frame that people tell you can. And that's the biggest difference is everyone wants everything right now. And they're not prepared to, to, to show up consistently and diligently to work towards it. Now, I, I had a billionaire uh, mentor for a while, really nice guy, not on social, owns a bunch of car yards across WA, Northern Territory and so forth. And I used to go and sit in his office once a fortnight and we'd chat like all things mindset and spirituality and quantum physics and relationships. He's just a really, really cool guy. And he, he said something to me once that was that was that I thought was quite profound and, I, and I, I put in the book under the goal section. And he said, Barry, he said, the goal should never be the variable. Like what you want should never be the variable. He said, what the variable is, is the amount of energy, effort and attention you're willing to put in to attain that goal. And to me, there's a game changer because what, what I realized is that I was setting goals and I would get close to them and not achieve them. So I'd move the goalpost. Uh -huh. And what was happening is, I was, is unbeknownst to me, I was conditioning myself that like nearly was enough, yep. right? I, I wasn't seeing things through and that pattern was playing out everywhere in my life. And once I realized that I, was, I started to question, are my goals actually my goals? And, and Mark Manson's book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, he talked about that. Like, are your goals your goals? If they are your goals, are they important enough? And what are you willing to do to attain them? And I think that's the biggest thing right now. Like, like for, for the people watching this tonight, like look at what you're trying to achieve. Do you actually really want to achieve that? Or do you want to achieve the feeling that you perceive is going to give you? Yes. And if you identify that, how can you elicit or how can you achieve that feeling right now without having to have the car, the career, the money, the, the, the wife, the husband, the child, whatever that case is. Like why wait to some point in the future to experience something you can have right now. That's and once we have that right now, you'll actually find it's a lot, a lot easier to achieve your goals. You know, I think that's great. And I look, look, a lot of times people want that fancy car just because someone else wants and they're, they're buying all this crap that they don't even want just to impress other people. It's just crazy. I totally agree. And I think, you know, what you've said is so powerful because you really need to choose your pain in life. Yeah. Because, because you're going to get it anyway. And you yeah. might as well choose it, choose it because you'd say, okay, I want this goal. I choose the pain along that path. There was, what's, what's that quote? Um, being wealthy is hard, being broke is, broke is hard, choose your hard. Exactly. And yeah. you know, they say the long path and the short path, and they say, well, the long path's not so long and the short path's not so short. Yeah. You know, and I, I agree. I think, um, but I really think I prefer the pain of discipline compared to the pain of regret. Yeah. And and I, 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 yeah, go. No, 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 no. I, I just want to state too, like if there's anyone watching this, they're like, oh, these guys are all about money. Like if you know me well enough or know George well enough, you know that's, that's absolutely the complete opposite. No. I just know what money can do. Like I know what having wealth can do in terms of the impact that I can make, in terms of the investments that I can create, in terms of the opportunities I can create for employees and, and so forth like that. And I think at the end of the day is uh, people have this aversion to, to money, right? Because of maybe the way they've been brought up or because of the way that they've seen people treat money in power and so forth. But I think money provides us a lot of freedom, right? It provides us freedom. And you know what I see time and time again within our community, the game changers, is when clients move out of from that place of scarcity where they've been for so long, like hustling, grinding, getting nowhere in their business to where they start to, you know, make more money than they, than they can spend, have more time than they know what to do with and create greater fulfillment. Every single time they switch up and it's like, how can I create a greater contribution? Exactly. Totally. How, how can I make a difference? How can I help others do the same thing? How me on the call the other day? It's like, how can I help other concreters succeed? How can I help concrete my, 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 my team retire in 15 years? Like every single time, once they move out of that place, it goes to contribution. It so does. This, is not, this is not about having shitloads of money to buy fancy things. Sure, like I like nice things, but this is about the impact that having money can create. Uh, Greg here from Sydney's got a question. He says, uh, is George optimistic about investing in the construction business? Okay, um, that's a, <laughs> look, I, I specialize in property only. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I don't know about the construction business. I'm, obviously, there's going to be, 
look, I really think that no matter what industry you're in, even declining industry, there's still winners in that industry that are going to do well. So true. Right? It's because so a lot true. of people go, oh, I'm going to do, you know, I know one guy, he's, he's, he wants to, he, he's a lawyer, now he wants to be a psychologist. And, wow. I said, and I said, wow, that's a massive change. That's a huge switch. And he said, he said, well, psychology is going up 20% per year. I'm thinking, well, that's nothing. Who cares? Because all you've got to do is be an excellent lawyer and you don't have to worry about going up or down. But So I really think that any, any industry is worth investing if you back in the right company and the right thing anyway. And I, I think it comes back to, again, like investing first in your mindset. Like someone asked a question on the earlier live stream. They're like, oh, does, does Harmy believe his business is recession proof? And he's like, well, no, like no business is really recession proof. And if you think that it is like you're, you're not looking somewhere that's going to smack you in the, in the back. That's the way that I said, if, if you have that belief that like, oh, we're, we're going to write anything out. No bullshit. What I said is I believe my mindset's recession proof. I believe that regardless of what life throws me and I've had enough proof of that, I will find a way to move through that. I'll find a way to come out better for it. And I think that that's where, where we should be focusing is how do we, how do we build this bulletproof mindset, heart set connection with ourselves, connection with those around us, that regardless of the situation, we know we're going to be okay. Yeah, then, well, then we're not thrown by COVID. We're not thrown by like, think about this right now. When have you not had enough? Like, and that's not just to you, George, that's everyone. Like when yeah. have we not had enough to survive? The reality is, is we have, that's why we're still here. Exactly. Exactly. So we've always had it. I, I think, uh, what you're talking about is ego really because ego is what pe makes people get upset about recession or things downturning or anything else like that because really at the end of the day life is life the journey is the journey and i really believe the obstacle is the way and as you go along your path yeah. you go to the that's obstacle the second, that's the second time someone said that today during yeah. a live stream and the obstacle becomes your path and then yeah. you the next obstacle and really there's only one way of having no obstacles in life that's being dead so yeah. obstacles, you should be grateful for obstacles and every obstacle is the path forward. Yeah. Yeah. Fall in love with the journey, not with the outcome, because the outcome never feels like you thought it would. No. I mean, it's a bit like Olympic athletes. They, they train all their lives to get the gold. Yeah. And they've got that brief moment of getting the gold. It's amazing. And then they've got post gold, um, what do you call it? Depression. And they really, Trauma, do. Yeah. they really do. And it's terrible. And I find, um, I know some athletes. Yeah. I used to, I used to date a girl that was quite Here we go. high up in high <laughs> But I don't want to mention her name, but she was very good when she was younger. Amazing. One of the top, yeah. top uh, tennis players in Australia. And then yeah. what happened was, after that, she just was a bit depressed because nothing was really getting her excited. After, yeah. being, after being adored by all these people and thinking that she's amazing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, look... I, I don't know, like it's been the hardest year a lot of people have ever had in life. And yet the interesting thing, you know, thing I find is that, you know, it almost seems like as many people have had a tough and challenging year, there's as many, if not more people are like, you know what, this has been amazing. Like I've had more time with my family or I've changed my offering, my business, or I've moved away from a job I never enjoyed. And, you know, neither are right and neither are wrong. It's just different perspectives and how people are choosing to see the situation. This is why, like, I'm just such a big believer around the inner game when it comes to growing businesses. You know, like this is, this, is, this is what we drill in time and time again, is that once you learn to master your inner game, like both your psychology and your mindset, but also I, I believe in more than I believe, like connection to our heart and to our heart, to, to God, to source, to energy, to whatever it is for you. It's yeah. like, that's when we're unstoppable. That's when we're living inspired. That's when we're living on purpose, regardless of the money and the time and anything else. It's like life come at me, like show me, show me what's there. Allow me to rise to challenge because I think that we never get dished up anything. We don't already have the capability to overcome. And if you don't overcome it, you're going to get dished up again and again and again until you do overcome it. You know what I mean? Because if you ignore a problem, it's going to come back. Down. Yeah. It's going to come back. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. and look, go, let's go back to money, not buying happiness. I I've never seen an unhappy person on a jet ski. Exactly, but look, I, I believe money can buy happiness. I really do. But but that's because money, money can't buy happiness because some people don't know what to spend it on. And you know, some because what happens is, you know, the foundation, as you said, is freedom. Mm. And you need money and time for that. Mm. So if you've got money and no time, you still haven't got that freedom. But then, you know, I, you see rich billionaires on you know 60 minutes having interviews all depressed you know one guy sold a 500 million dollar company he was depressed because he had money but he didn't have fulfilling relationships 
Yeah. Because without fulfilling relationships, what's the point of having freedom and money? Because I really think that's one of the keys. And then health. You can go to uh, any cancer ward and say, hey, how would you like a $10 million? And you probably get a bedpan thrown at you because they need help. That's what they need. They need, you know what I mean? So I, I, think, I think health's number one. Health's number one for me and, and relationships, number two. But it took me a long time to get that. Like, you know, I separated from the mother of my kids uh, when I went through bankruptcy nine years ago, mm-hmm. you know, around just that because I was doing what I thought I needed to do as a provider of the family. She was doing what she thought she needed to do. We're both doing the same things. It was just one was speaking Chinese and one was speaking Italian. You know, we're having the same experience, but what we weren't is we weren't aligned in our relationship. We weren't on the same page. We weren't moving towards common goals. And therefore there was a, there was a ton of conflict. We both felt abandoned and alone and not respected and not looked after. And I think that, you know, that that is a tragedy that a lot of people face as well. And yeah. sometimes, unfortunately, have to face the pain or the challenge of the adversity to kind of have that awakening and realisation. I think that in many ways we attract we attract a lot of the adversities that we have to help us to grow and to to become better versions of ourselves. Totally. Um, your biggest fear, a lot of times you, you create your biggest fear because you think about it all the time. That's what people yeah. do, a lot. I've Absolutely. seen people do that over and over again, you know, you know, because a lot of people, they're running away from something instead of going towards something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mel Power here. Hey, Mel, how you doing? Uh, go, George. People have an aversion to money, but the money provides freedom. We need to change our relationship to money and how uh, and how you know, how we can make a difference in the money. Absolutely. Mel, you're amazing what you're doing, making a huge impact uh, as well, Dylan. Uh Tony here. In your thoughts, what kind of effect is COVID going to have on the price of property? Great question. Good question. And um, I'd like to answer that. So basically, what happens whenever there's a big economic downturn so let's go back in history because history doesn't necessarily repeat but it rhymes yeah and i always look at history to try to work out what's going to happen in the future of property yeah i'm a bit of a nerd i'll look at stats and things like that so back in 1987 there was black monday that's when the stock market had the biggest crash ever it was so bad that people jumping out of buildings killing themselves because they're so upset about it they talk about ego Mm. (laughs) you know what i mean that's all ego but that's what happened and Everyone said the property is dead. You know, it's never going to go up again. And I remember driving down um, Green Hill Road in Adelaide and it was just for lease, for lease, for sale, for lease, for lease, the whole road, all the commercial properties. Because commercial dies when stuff like that happens completely. Because once when companies go down, commercial goes down. Mm. When companies go up, commercial go up. So mm. the stock market, commercial property, have got a little bit of a rhythm to each other. Mm. So commercial property gets affected very strongly by these downturns. Then what happens, and this is the interesting thing, is there's always, um, because property averages that 7.2%. So if it dips, it wants to go back to the average. And if it goes above that average, it wants to go back down to the average. So what happens is then there's a massive rebound. And the 90s was one of the biggest booms in history of property. Then we had GFC 2008. And 2008 GFC, what happened was there was the GFC, property went down a little bit again then we had a massive rebound now this is the problem people that are speculators they're like okay i'm gonna wait on the sidelines and i'm gonna dive in when i'm right and they're waiting 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 they blink suddenly properties have doubled they've missed it again yeah i mean the problem is if you're waiting for that property boom you're not going to get there you need to be in the market you need to have property to make money out of property yeah so so me personally I'm not concerned what's happening with property short term. I'm more concerned what's happening long term. That's what matters. So property in some areas may go down, right? That's the fact of it. And and other properties will go up. And I guess one of the things I do to really hedge my bets is out of the 6,000 suburbs in Australia, out of the 6,000 markets, I'm only picking the top 100 in a certain state. Mm. So because I'm picking up top 100, I'm really hedging my bets that these are going to perform. And what I found is these top 100 suburbs, the ones that I had, because I had properties before I knew about this, and they actually went up during 2008, where my other properties didn't do so well. And there's my microphone went down. I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, just. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Let me go a little bit closer. My head's yeah. going to be too big though. Anyway. So yeah, so, um, so when, you know, I, I think what I do is like, it's a bit like, have you heard the story about the grasshopper and the ant? No. Okay, so the ant, what does the ant do in summer? It works really hard and collects stuff and puts it down there. 
right? Because the ant in summer is thinking winter. That's what it's thinking. Yeah. And what does it think in winter? It think, it's thinking about summer. And I'm a bit like the ant. When the property market's going down, I'm realizing it's going to go up again. Yeah. If it's going up, I realize it's going to go down again. Who, who is it that said, um, get greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy? Warren Buffett said that. And yeah. personally, I don't like the word fearful or greedy. <laughs> Mm. I get what he's saying, but I think don't be greedy and don't be fearful. Be prepared mm. and do that instead. But really, at the end of the day, when people get overexcited when property is going up, I don't get as excited. And when people get excited that they're going down, I don't get as excited because really, at the end of the day, they're going to come back to their normal. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if you're thinking long term, you're not a speculator and you've got a solid foundation, you've got the proper strategies, you should be constantly investing bit by bit in a safe way. Yeah, what's happening? Whether it's going up or down. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Um, so, George, if people were wanting to connect with you, find out more about the amazing work that you do, what's the best place for them to find you at? Well, if they're in, if they're on Facebook, I've got a Facebook group where we've got over three thousand, you know, thriving members of people that are interested in investing and things like that. And that's a Facebook group called Property Secrets. Yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. Yep. In there, actually, I go live in there once a week anyway, so that way, you know, I can talk to people and interact with them. And Facebook, I like Facebook, I like talking to people and interacting with people. It's part of the reason I started this business, you know. Yeah, 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 love that. And uh, look, if you want to stay up to date with all the amazing guests we're bringing on here onto the Freedom Livestream series, uh, I'll put a link below here, click on it. Register your details. We'll send you through reminders about what's coming up and also let you know uh, about my book when it comes out officially on the 3rd of August. Uh, but we're doing a pre-release launch this Sunday with a bunch of bonuses. So make sure that you're tuning live on Sunday. There'll be one episode. I think it's 8 a.m. Perth time, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. I'm not sure what time that is in the, in the States for those of you watching in America. 9.30 Adelaide time. 9.30 Adelaide time. Uh, but... That's that. George, one question. Knowing what you know now, if you were to have a conversation with a 10-year-old version of you, what advice would you give him? Look, great question. I'd say to my 10-year-old self, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Just go along your path and enjoy your challenges. You know, because I spent a lot of time, with, like a lot of people, is when I got faced with challenges, oh, no, not another challenge. Yeah. And you get another challenge, oh, no. But now I embrace them and enjoy them. That's all. Yeah. And I think that's what I tell my 10 year old self, just enjoy the challenge, enjoy the journey. Don't worry about destination. Yeah, I love that. Uh, be curious to know, like comment in the chat below, what was the biggest takeaway from tonight's live series? Uh, please as well, share it around, let other people know about the amazing stuff that we're doing here and the phenomenal guests we've got on board, uh, like George, there's some amazing ones coming up over the next few weeks as well in the lead up to the launch of the book. Uh, that's it for us tonight. I appreciate you uh, watching. We'll be live again in the next hour uh, with another phenomenal guest. I'm really looking forward to having him on board. So if you're about the place, uh, please jump on board. Otherwise, look forward to seeing the next one soon. George, thank you so much. Appreciate your time, everything you've shared, and uh, look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Game Changers podcast. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd love you to do to help us and help yourself to spread the message further. Uh, make sure that you like the Game Changers on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, please subscribe by clicking the link below to ensure that you keep up to date with the weekly episodes we uh, share here at the Game Changers podcast with amazing entrepreneurs and business owners around the world. And of course, like if you're in a position where you may be overwhelmed with business or looking for a way to grow faster and more effectively, and you realize that the key to success is being surrounded by amazing people who have been there and done that before, I'd like to invite you to apply to have a game plan session one-on-one -on -one with one of my team here at The Game Changers. There's no cost. If you get through, uh, all that we ask is that you are doing a minimum of $250,000 per year to really be able to utilize the strategies and the tactics and the mindset shifts that we share with you, uh, that you're coachable, that you're a decent person and you're, you know, you're willing to take on board some advice. If not, that's totally cool. Uh, but I know for me, I wouldn't be where I'm right now without the support of so many mentors and coaches and resources along the way. And I'd like to pay that forward and give back to you the opportunity to work with uh, us one-on-one -on -one for free to put together a customized game plan. And the reason we're doing this is a couple of things. Number one is that sometimes it's just the smallest thing that can make the biggest difference. And uh, 
I think that entrepreneurs and business owners have the option to change the world. And if we can maybe help you to, to make the smallest shift to change your life and your world, uh, you're changing ours in return. The second thing is that we are always looking for amazing clients to work with and to welcome into and invite into the Game Changers community. And so if at the end of the call, you do feel that there's a huge amount of value there, uh, that we fit, feel that there's a great value fit there, we can have a conversation about working together. But uh, this game plan call, there's absolutely no obligations to work with whatsoever. Allow us to help you with uh, the years and years and years of, of knowledge that we have in growing and scaling great companies. Companies. And uh, I think that uh, business owners are the future of the world. If there's a way that we can help you to create a better business, more profit, more fulfillment, more fun, I would love the opportunity to do that now. So click the link below, book your game plan session. Make sure you follow us on social and start today with the latest episodes of the Game Changers podcast. My name's Barry William Magaditi. Thank you so much for your support and look forward to seeing the next one. Bye for now.